almost all wildlife photographers shoot exclusively with the Super Telephoto lens. But for the past month, I've been shooting with only the Sigma 70 to 200 millimeter f2.8 sports lens. And let me tell you, it caught me off guard and I was blown away by my results. This lens was sent over to me by Sigma themselves. However, I wasn't paid by them for this review. They have no say in how this video turns out. And I'm returning this gear at the end of this month. This video does have a sponsor though, and that's Squarespace, a phenomenal website platform for photographers to showcase their work and sell products. Starting off, the image stabilization on this lens is fantastic. It reaches up to 7.5 stops in image stabilization, and for me, never felt like it caused any serious problems out in the field. Especially up to around 165 millimeters, the footage truly was so stable that I felt I would never need a tripod when capturing video. Past 165 millimeters and up to 200 millimeters, I did start to notice a little bit of shake, but I would define it more as that, simply noticed and not a serious problem, and by no means ruined any footage. For photography, I believe that you would truly never have a need for a tripod to correct camera shake from your hands as it is just that good. Throughout this video, you'll see me comparing this lens a lot to my Sigma 135 1.8, since this lens really fits into that type of use case much more than your typical super telephoto lenses. And in regards to image stabilization, this lens does outperform the Sigma 135, which has a complete lack of image stabilization built into the lens. This lens autofocuses quickly, however, I predict that even more importantly is its ability to manually focus incredibly effectively, just the same as what I said for the Sigma 135. Since this lens, even fully zoomed in, has a slightly wider focal length than your standard wildlife photography range of 300 millimeters and up, it can cause difficulties for cameras occasionally in trying to pick up the subject and autofocus. That being said, the manual focus ring is very smooth and heavier set, giving a very fine touch that allows for you to finesse the perfect manual focus with the depth of field so shallow as 2.8. It also requires a very small pull and turn, which is nice that you won't find yourself turning your hand over and over again just to adjust focus. The only complaint that I have about the focus ring is that it's placed so close to the aperture ring, which sometimes got me confused instinctively, and I would turn the aperture ring instead of the focus ring. I suspect that this would naturally get corrected by my muscle memory over time. However, over the course of my time with it throughout the month, I still found myself double guessing which ring I was actually trying to turn. Before we get into some of the most important things for you to know about this lens, I wanna introduce you guys a little more to the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. Squarespace is a website builder that's incredibly simple to learn and use due to their fluid engine and provides for a seamless building experience. Back when I knew nothing on how to build a website, I was able to build a photography portfolio I liked in just a few short hours that I could show off to people that I knew. Recently, I've been taking a new step with Squarespace and I've been using their email marketing integrated into their website to launch my very first newsletter I've ever created. This newsletter has the hottest news and the best gear discounts available in the space, and I couldn't have built it without Squarespace. Anyone who signs up for my newsletter will receive a free in the field PDF cheat sheet filled with wildlife photography tips in my email I send out next week. And if you're interested in learning more, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Jeremy Knipe to save 10% off your purchase of a website or domain. Now, where does this lens really shine? I'd like to make the argument that in one such area such as low light, this lens beats out a lot of the competition. Coming in at a constant 2.8 f-stop, this lens is made to be used in darker scenarios and get more moody shots around sunrise or sunset. Coming in at a full seven third stops lower than the typical lens, or in other words, two full stops than your average 6.3, this lens gives you the ability to shoot much more low light than your average super telephoto. For example, on this morning out doing wildlife photography from my recent video I just released in San Francisco, while it looks brighter in this video, it was truly so dark, I had only started to be able to make out the bird silhouettes in the distance for the past 10 minutes or so. Meaning, in other words, it was very, dark. While we're discussing f-stop numbers, the 2.8 gives a really nice and shallow depth of field as well, which is key for a lot of well-isolated, wider wildlife photography images. If we translate the 135 1.8 in comparison to the Sigma 70 to 200 2.8, the Sigma 135 still turns out quite a bit more shallow. However, if megapixels are limited, this extra reach may make up for it. 
Comparing the Sigma 70 to 200 2.8 to your average 100 to 400 5.6 though, it's actually exactly the same depth of field, which is pretty crazy to think about. If you double the focal range of the 200 millimeters to 400 millimeters by cropping in, you lose two full stops in depth of field, which brings you to 400 millimeters 5.6 the exact same amount as your typical 100-400. So actually, if you have a high megapixel camera and plenty of extra pixels to crop in with, shooting with this lens can give you just as shallow of the depth of field at the same reach as a typical 100 to 400 millimeter zoom. Now, allow me to go off on a tangent about that for a moment. I've talked a lot recently about the overhype of high megapixel cameras, but I have to say, this is one area I've really noticed their usefulness with in wildlife photography in the past couple months. When shooting at high focal length super telephoto lenses, I've discovered that my 50 megapixel sensor has been quite overkill and at times even harmful. But with lenses like this, where I'm going to find myself noticeably cropping in on half my shots, it's been incredibly useful and allowed me to have less limitations. Great. Raining in the middle of my review. Well, now that I've just been rained on, <laughs> we'll try to get through this gear review a little bit quicker. Back to the lens, I'll touch on the build quality a little bit before we get into the most important part of any lens really, which is the glass quality and image sharpness. This lens, when it comes to weight, is about what I would expect. At 1,345 grams, it weighs almost double the weight of most full frame mirrorless bodies and weighs significantly more than both the latest Panasonic 100 to 400 and Olympus 300 millimeter MFT lenses that I tested last year. It weighs nearly the same as the Sigma 135. Obviously, when compared to big full frame super telephoto primes, this lens is still incredibly light, however, and for someone like me, it's incredibly easy to carry out and about. The lens foot is pretty good. Good in the way that they included the Arca Swiss mounting directly onto the lens foot as Sigma has been doing with all of their lenses recently. This is unessential for me and I really don't like when other companies fail to do this. However, the lens foot is a little bit shallow in my opinion and if you use a more heavy camera body such as my S1R, I find that the foot is a little too far forward on the lens to balance it correctly which leads to problems with balancing it on a tripod ideally or resting it in my hand more comfortably. It has all the typical custom function buttons and it has an incredible lens collar that I love on all the Sigma lenses with their beautiful locking mechanism. In my opinion, Sigma makes the best lens collars in the business, and I'm always pleased by the result. But undoubtedly, the most unique feature of this lens is Sigma's first ever aperture ring they've ever built into a stills designed lens. While I like this aperture ring a lot theoretically, and it's fun to use, in reality, I think it just kind of gets in the way more than I'd like as a wildlife photographer. Like I mentioned earlier, it competes for space with the manual focus ring right next to it, and because it's not stepless, it doesn't give me the ability to do a perfectly smooth aperture adjustment during video recording anyways. So for me, it's just an extra feature that is fun, but not really useful. So now to the meat of the lens. Let's talk about glass quality. The glass quality on this lens is ridiculously sharp so sharp that I'm actually having difficulties comparing it, this lens to the Sigma 135mm 1.8 I've been mentioning and deciding which one is sharper. Side by side, it seems too hard to tell, and if you watch me review that Sigma 135, you'll know that it was by far the sharpest lens I had ever used to photograph wildlife up to that point. To give an example, check out an image like this I took fully zoomed out and see how far I can zoom in without any significant detail loss. It's truly incredible. By this far in the zoom, the actual megapixels on the camera start to affect sharpness before the glass truly does. Now speaking of pixels, I did try to get to the bottom of which lens is sharper between this lens and the 135mm prime. And here's my conclusion. If shooting a subject filling the frame on both of these two lenses, sharpness is truly quite identical and I doubt anyone could possibly tell the difference. Not only is the center sharpness completely sharp, but corner sharpness is also phenomenal in both the two lenses. However, if you were to take these two lenses and shoot from the same distance away, it seems as if the Sigma 70-200mm to actually comes out sharper because of its extra reach. 
This means that while the Sigma 135 1.8 beats out the Sigma 70 to 200 in depth of field, when it comes to about 170 millimeters plus, the Sigma 70 to 200 beats out the 135 in sharpness. Because this lens is so sharp and because the f-stop is lower, it allows these crops to look pretty decent on this lens and pretty much the same as if you would have shot it on a super telephoto zoom in the first place. Like I mentioned before, if you have the extra megapixels, this lens will actually allow you the exact same depth of field results as a typical super telephoto zoom. So it partially negates the need for one when it comes to high megapixel photography. Although this only works up to a certain extent and doesn't carry over once you're highly cropping in with that super telephoto. Personally, I think this kind of flexibility is really cool as wider angle shots are deeply undervalued and not done enough in wildlife photography. Yet, because of the sharpness, it doesn't make me feel like I'm missing out on all my close-up opportunities when I use this lens too much since I can crop in if I need to. Image sharpness on this lens is so sharp that I'd go as far as to say that this is the sharpest zoom lens I have ever used of any kind, and I think it will be sharp enough to handle most all use cases as a wildlife photographer. I also did get the chance to shoot back lit a little, and I never noticed any fringing in the photos. And in other reviews by reputable reviewers, there didn't seem to be any big problems in regards to this either. As a last point of interest to some, I wanted to briefly mention that I did get to use it with the Sigma teleconverters and the results were pretty much on par with what I expected. Out in the field, the Sigma 1.4 teleconverter was helpful, but ultimately didn't blow me away as it's similar to just having cropped in post-production up until you get to the point of cropping so much that once again, megapixels affect it. So similarly to the 135 to 70 to 200 comparison just a minute ago, the 1.4 teleconverter does provide sharper images at a far distance. However, if compared side by side with frame filling objects, the Sigma 70 to 200 without the teleconverter is slightly sharper. I'll be linking all the sharpness test files alongside some other wildlife photos shot with this lens in the description below for anyone who signs up for my new free newsletter through that specific link. So make sure to do so if you'd like to download those files and blow them up at full resolution on your computer to see for yourself. Now, to sum up this lens, I think that I am incredibly pleased with its capabilities. I love how it's a little more middle ground than the Sigma 135 1.8, still wide to get those unique and underdone photos in wildlife photography, yet sharp enough to crop in and make it look like a mid-range super telephoto shot if needed. Who is this lens for? I believe that this lens is truly for someone trying to push their creative bounds of wildlife photography to a new level with wider angles and mid-range angles, but looking for a little bit of a safer bet than that Prime 135 1.8 that I talked about before. While the Prime 135 does have better capabilities at those slightly wider angles of about 135 to 200 or so, after 200 millimeters, the 70 to 200 2.8 really starts to win out and show off its versatility a little more. This leads me to believe that while this lens is still for a more advanced skill set of wildlife photographer, it's also a bit more friendly to the beginner skill level than the 135 1.8 Prime. Coming in at $1,500, I think that this lens is a very worthwhile buy. Because I own the Sigma 135 1.8, I'm tempted, but I don't think I'm going to be pulling the trigger on this lens personally, as they really are incredibly similar for most of my use cases. However, if you don't already own a 135 1.8 Prime or something similar, I think you should consider this lens to be maybe the new creative tool that you're looking to use. If you want to see more reviews like this, I'd be honored if you subscribe to the channel below. And if you want to check out my time out in the field doing bird photography with this Sigma 70-200, to check out this video here in the end screen.